If you were a PlayStation action-adventure game junkie in the late 90s, you might recall a fairly obscure title named Alundra. A spiritual successor to a popular Sega Genesis game, Alundra puts you in control of a blonde, pointy-eared protagonist with a penchant for swords, bows, and bombs, while exploring a vast, dangerous, and puzzle-filled world, and all from a three-quarters perspective. Sound familiar? Alendra has often been compared to The Legend of Zelda, and for good reason. When first comparing Link to the Past with Alendra, you see a bright, beautiful world of high adventure, and a simple combat system augmented with a wide array of tools and instruments, immediately recognizable to fans of the series but it was more of an evolution of the Super Nintendo version of Zelda, rather than the fully 3D Ocarina of Time, which made sweeping changes, which are now looked on with some contention. And though Nintendo left behind the two-dimensional overhead style of the original games for the later Zelda titles, the 2D portable spin-offs seemed to become increasingly less inspired. Aside from the purported 2.5-dimensional A Link Between Worlds, the classic style of Zelda seems to be all but abandoned. Now, Alendra might sound just like a simple knockoff of Nintendo's ElfQuest and Classic, but similarities start to fade as you delve deeper into the game's design. Six whole years after Link to the Past, and a full year before Zelda's Nintendo 64 follow-up, this lower-profile spiritual successor featured a more fleshed-out story, deeper characters, darker themes, challenging puzzles, and a universe begging to be expanded on. In short, this was The Legend of Zelda grown up. So it is with great interest that I examine 1997's obscure classic adventure, Alundra. really can't bring up Alendra without sneaking The Legend of Zelda into the same sentence. The original Zelda for the Nintendo Entertainment System was the very first console game to feature a battery save, a worthy feature for the generation-defining, open-ended gaming experience of the 8-bit gaming era, and its influence echoes through hundreds of games even today. But Alendra's direct inspiration has its origins on the Sega Genesis, with a 1993 action-adventure game called Landstalker. Created by Tokyo-based developer Climax Entertainment, it was a bright, colorful romp through grassy fields, forests, and dungeons. Players controlled a familiar-looking, blonde elf swordsman in a green tunic, an almost actionable similarity to Link from The Legend of Zelda. Yet Landstalker was quite different from its Nintendo contemporary, with a 45-degree angle and the inclusion of jumping and a true elevation engine. The game was less about treading at a steady pace, carefully facing foes and pushing blocks, and more about springing around like a sword-wielding tigger while besting baddies and conquering puzzles. Though playing second fiddle to the first-party titles of the Genesis and Super Nintendo, Climax's underdog adventure did quite well, and was especially successful in Japan. Two years post-release, some developers from Climax Entertainment and fellow Sega Genesis developer Telenet Japan left their respective companies and formed Matrix Software in 1994. And after three years in the making, they debuted their passion project, Alundra. It borrowed many elements from Landstalker, both mechanical and cosmetic, but rather than a 45-degree angle, presented a straight-on view, similar to Zelda, A Link to the Past. With Sony Computer Entertainment as their publisher, Matrix Software was now creating the Zelda equivalent for the new and popular PlayStation console. Its anime influence was clear, with big 80s hair characters and fully animated cutscenes. The visual charm and sound design mimicked that style as well. Having state-of-the-art hardware at its back, the graphics have aged gracefully along such contemporaries like Castlevania Symphony of the Night and Metal Slug. Added to this was its bright and energetic soundtrack by Kohei Tanaka, who has composed for countless anime shows, movies, and video games ranging from Pokemon to One Piece, to the popular PS Vita title Gravity Rush. Working Designs was signed on as the American publisher of the game, a quirky company known for localizing Japanese strategy games and RPGs. Its flavorful translation gives Lundra a modernized feel to its dialogue. The local blacksmith insisting you use his diary remarks that he can only write Made a Sword Today so many times. A woman speaks about a girl you chanced across earlier, and only alludes to her being her daughter at the end of the conversation. It just feels natural, and therefore more engaging. Alundra was much more of a story-driven game compared to the earlier Zelda games. After a bit of heavier writing at the game's start, 
A link to the past can then go on for hours with little to read. In contrast, Alendra digs into dark and uncomfortable themes, like watching the slow, inevitable death of a fellow villager, or listening to the rantings of a schizophrenic daughter who thinks she's royalty while her father wastes away from alcoholism downstairs, or the disturbing idea of false prophets and the dangers of manipulative religions, amongst other themes. The plot revolves around an elven adventurer named Alundra, hence the title. He is met in a dream by a sage named Lars and is told to go to the village of Inoa, for he is needed there. Aboard a ship called the Clark, one night a terrible storm shatters it into a thousand pieces, and Alundra awakens in the care of the blacksmith of said village. With recurring dreams involving two spectral figures fighting, Alundra soon discovers he is a long-lost descendant of Elna, a tribe of dreamwalkers and possesses the power to traverse the minds and nightmares of others, and save them from a great evil that plagues all of Torla. A local desperate scholar trying to solve why people fall into deadly nightmares turns to Alendra for help. A good two-thirds of the game is spent traversing the real world, exploring dungeons and fighting monsters like the Murg, an aggressive race of apes set on ending humanity, driven by the wicked Milzas, a spectral figure who taunts Alendra whether he is awake or in a dream. As the story unfolds, you will become enraptured with the world Alendra sets before you. As you learn the nature behind your powers and the lineage of heroes you descend from, you see that Alendra's world had a lot going for it and much room for growth. But the most thematic parts of the game are when you access a villager's dream. The dread you feel entering the mind of a victim is something to experience. The eerie, off-kilter music box and flute soundtrack, along with the otherworldly atmosphere of each scenario, keeps you on your toes. Even the laws of physics and space-time become jumbled. You may enter a door and then exit the same door, only to find the room is completely transmogrified. Everyone's natural fear of the unknown is tinkered with in the nightmarish dreamwalker sequences of Alundra. If you're stuck, there is a thematic hint system in the form of a fortune teller. For a small handful of Gilder, she'll gaze into the crystal ball, hint at your next objective, and a glow will appear on the otherwise unavailable map. In Inua and the surrounding lands, you have multiple shopkeepers with different stocks. And Alundra's wonderfully kinetic gameplay shines here as you pick up goods off the shelf and toss them onto the counter in order to purchase them. In a way, Alundra's world is more sensically designed than Zelda's, as important items and tools aren't randomly acquired from a box that happened to be stored right next to its intended purpose, but usually have a more organic origin. Often, the blacksmith will be inspired by the spirits of the recently departed and craft a new tool for you to use. The Zelda-like overworld map has a never-ending amount of landscaping to do, with treasure to find underneath the endless brush and undergrowth you find in the world. The game lures you in with simplistic combat and puzzles at first, with few gimmicks or tools beyond the ordinary. What you don't yet realize is that the game is imprinting the controls and core mechanics firmly into your mind, as you will need a deft command of these for upcoming challenges. Right away, you'll notice you have a jump button, something the old-school Zelda games never had. A seemingly minor addition, but with Alundra's fully fleshed out three axis movement and elevation system, this changes everything. There is platforming and the careful stacking of objects to reach an objective. You now have to worry about the height difference of floors, pillars, and blocks in relation to your current location before taking a leap, making this into something of a fast-paced hybrid of Zelda's puzzling and exploration and a three-dimensional Mario or Castlevania game. The smooth, effective verticality in leaping from ledge to ledge in Alundra definitively separates it from other games of its ilk, and its pervasive traversal mechanics instill a sense of freedom of movement rare in games of this genre. Zelda A Link to the Past allowed you to jump down to a lower level or walk up to a higher one, but these were more cosmetic than anything, in the end acting more like one-way walls. Not only does Alundra's Z-axis add a new dimension to puzzles and platforming situations, it also ties directly into combat with enemies hopping to platforms to attack from above, or your ability to toss bombs up to higher elevations. Experimentation is key here and makes for some fun environmental interaction, but is also a core ingredient to the game's more obtuse and challenging puzzle design. A 
Alundra's early combat isn't particularly inspired, with sluggish monsters that are easily defeated by stunlocking them with continual hits. But as you progress, your starting dagger is replaced by a sword with a charge up attack and additional upgrades. You'll also obtain many alternate weapons like flails, bows, and wands, but later enemies will have better or worse tactics for taking them down. Sledges are slow but deadly at melee range, so a bow or a wand will work wonders, whereas the strategic lizardmen with guard stances and invulnerability states are better fought with a well-timed charge attack. Turtles shell up if you move far away, and some enemies teleport or go invisible. In this way, each enemy can be sort of a mini puzzle to defeat. Some bosses have multiple phases that catch you off guard, such as the Soul Leech, who sucks you and all the other things on the screen toward it, presenting the challenge of hitting it without being consumed by its gaping maw. The later bosses introduce puzzle-like mechanics and complications, such as finding which clone is the correct one to hit, or fighting off mobs of smaller enemies to get a clear shot at them. You eventually gain magic scrolls, which allow you to expend magic points for powerful area of effect attacks. For some bosses, these are basically win buttons. But are oddly optional most of the time, and that is a recurring design quirk with this game, that solutions for conflicts aren't always a one option ordeal. Unlike Zelda's mostly straightforward puzzles, which often required using the tool you just acquired to activate the centerpiece of a given room, Alundra utilizes its much more flexible core mechanics to mix things up. The game methodically teaches you to be watchful of obfuscated objects or hidden clues, which then inspire you to thoroughly investigate rooms in the future. That is an ongoing lesson in Alundra. Pay attention, look beyond what is immediately presented, and use your basic abilities and wits to come up with a solution, and often relies on very few gimmicks or tricks for you to complete it. Each dungeon or dream might introduce a new type of object or idea, such as sliding icy pillars, or pressure plates, but you'll have to use cold, hard logic to succeed. In the case of crossing difficult terrain, you'll have to observe your surroundings, find something pushable or climbable, or an object that you can place as a temporary platform. For instance, the second of two railway machines you have to fix in the coal mine appears to be a simple flip switch puzzle, just like the one you did before, but a nearby sign states exactly how many pulls of each switch is needed, but that the machine in question is old and finicky. Many players might get stumped here for several minutes, trying to figure out the perfect amount of switches to whack, not realizing that you have to jump up and down on top of the machine to kick it into gear. And it's times like this that Alundra transcends from simple, gamey puzzles to full-on, logic challenges. But right when you feel like you're getting the hang of things, the game presents even more challenging puzzles. This is where Alundra absolutely demands your humility. This game will frustrate and madden those who are used to modern, pandering game design filled with big red markers telling you to go here. And the culture shock of being completely stumped can be trying at times. Should you miss or not properly interpret a hint or set of instructions, the game slyly tossed at you earlier. A couple hours in, you'll start to be presented with riddles inscribed on the walls of Lara's crypt. And here's when the game turns from an easygoing romp to a challenge that demands reverence. In one of its later rooms, you'll likely run up the stairs, solve a puzzle, fight some monsters, and then go to the next room, only to be back at the puzzle again. Half a dozen times later, you'll realize this is an endless loop, and the rooms and which exit you take out of them is a puzzle in itself. The introduction of riddle puzzles here is cleverly timed, as the story beat of that particular area is testing your resolve and gaining the respect of the spirits to see if you are worthy. It's at times like these that Alundra rises up above your average action-adventure game and speaks to you through mechanics. Alundra will often take a very simple puzzle concept that takes just seconds to understand, such as matching a set of statues to a set of symboled squares, only to introduce all sorts of variants to the challenge with each new room, like placing them in a certain sequence, having to time your drop to squares that rhythmically switch between symbols, uncovering hidden statues, or having to strategically use the statues as stepping stones to get to the others. Whereas some dungeons are light on puzzles and instead rely heavily on combat, one room in the coastal cave has you walking atop a wall while fighting orcs and other monsters, all the while carefully jumping from ledge to ledge, pushing the next button. Should you fall, you have to exit and re-enter the room to start the four-stage battle once again. Reptile's Lair requires you to fight off dozens of lizardmen spawning from statues as you slowly trek through to the dungeon's end. Alendra leverages its stellar movement and elevation system via many time-sensitive platform sequences. It can get punishing, but it's surprisingly not as bad as you might think due to the tight, responsive controls. 
Many puzzles are kinetic, requiring the pushing or tossing of a particular object, and because not everything is precisely assigned to a specific tile or grid, it can feel like you accidentally figured out a puzzle, whether or not that's true, or the game designers intended you to feel that way regardless. Either way, it's satisfying, and whether you know what you did or not, you get sharper for the next challenge. As much as I dislike dragging out the often referenced Dark Souls effect, the comparison here is sound. Part of what makes these series so compelling is how the fair but unforgiving difficulty the game offers constantly pushes you to your limit. You are trained to become better and wiser. And honestly, I think Alendra is one that fits this bill perfectly. Even the portal-based fast travel system is a hidden secret, unlocked through a series of jumping puzzles, a key, another puzzle, and a six-set memory and dexterity puzzle. You heard right. One major method of traversal could be completely missed by many players. That's how hardcore this game is. I could list and describe the literal hundreds of interesting puzzles this game presents you, but they are just too numerous and clever to spoil them all here. But Alandra easily features some of the most mind-warping and creative puzzles I've played in a game to date, without the constant need to add more complicated moves or items as a crutch. You'll smack your head and say, why didn't I think of that? When you realize this puzzle requires a trick, the game taught you two whole dungeons ago. It's a game that players can respect, in both its infinite cleverness and its incessant mission to make you a better participant. Alendra ending on a strong note and hinting at new lands to explore and adventures to pursue, the fans of the game were left wanting more. Many fans of the genre were likely brought back to Nintendo's good graces by Zelda The Ocarina of Time a year later in 1998, yet Alendra 2 quietly released in the States in the year 2000, developed by much of the same crew at Matrix Software but now published by Activision. Muffled marketing and an unenthusiastic release aside, what did we get? Let's begin with the title. Alendra 2, A New Legend Begins. The reality is that it doesn't even have the character Alendra, or the village of Inoa, Dreamwalkers, or anything to do with the world of Torla. Story-wise, it is a sequel and title only. Instead, we are presented with the adventures of Flint, a pirate captain, and his adventures through the steampunk world of Varuna. Having a new writer on board may have inspired this departure from the entire story and setting of Alendra. And if that wasn't enough, the game was now in full 3D. Not colorful, smooth 3D like in the Nintendo 64 Zelda, but low to middle of the road PlayStation 3D. Don't get me wrong, there have been some amazing visuals on the PSX. Look no further than the pre-rendered backgrounds and simplistic models of Final Fantasy 7, 8, and 9, or Metal Gear Solid for fully 3D gameplay that fully utilized its hardware. But Alundra 2 is sluggish. It has a lower frame rate, a clunky camera one has to manually guide to see around corners, a less interesting setting and story, and jarring perspective shifts into slow makeshift side-scrolling battles and swimming sequences. Hit detection was an issue, and animations were stiff all around, making for a considerably less smooth and responsive experience. The soundtrack was less inspired and more repetitive, despite enlisting the original composer. Though the same director and designer, Yasuhiro Ohori, was involved in both games, there was a definitive shift in direction and style, with the Zelda-like damage pips in the dozens being replaced with damage numbers in the hundreds. Some welcome voice dialogue was added to story sequences, but the tone and style of this new storyline was much more Saturday morning cartoon, with silly Scooby-Doo-esque villain monologues and story arcs, rather than the dark, atmospheric, sometimes disturbing twists and turns of its forebear. <laughs> Welcome to the Star Key, young Flint. It was kind of you to drop in. Though it did continue Alundra's stellar puzzle design, and Matrix Software clearly had a knack for creating new and interesting brain teasers, but under this new, rougher, and less polished presentation with clumsier controls, the game disappointed many fans of the original. So what happened here? While details are scarce, my take is that between the three-year development of Alundra and the three other games developed in between it and its sequel, compounded with a new 3D engine and technology they weren't as seasoned with unlike their previous games, 
The jerky transition from one character's animation to the next, weak modeling, and constant clipping of objects were telling. It was just too much. Too little experience and not enough hardware power to compensate for the amount of time and resources that went into the sequel, and it resulted in a disappointing follow-up. Not only from an audience response, but critically and financially. Developer Matrix Software continue to make games and are still active today, albeit on lower profile projects. More recently, they co-developed Dragon Quest V for the PlayStation 2, and later on helped port numerous Final Fantasy titles to the Android and iOS platforms. The original game's American publisher, Working Designs, closed in 2005, but a year later its president, Victor Ireland, re-established what was essentially the same company, with many of the old intellectual properties. Gaijin Works republished many games such as Alendra and Ark the Lad to the PlayStation Network, and continue to release more niche games even today. So here ends the short but inspired history of Alendra. I'd rather it had gone out with some fanfare at least than what we got, but I try not to let the shortcomings of its sequel diminish the far-reaching achievements of the original. And though Alundra may have sunk to a more obscure status in recent years, being outshone by 1997's other game, Final Fantasy VII, this video is my small tribute to a game whose devilish tricks, mind-bending puzzles, and legendary challenges still stand stronger than most other titles today. May it not be forgotten. Let me know your personal story with Zelda, Alundra, or the action-adventure genre in the comments. My deepest appreciation to the amazing people who give their hard-earned support to make this channel a reality. Check out my Patreon for perks, rewards, and the bonus of being proudly listed here. And thank you for watching.